pre-recorded from Joe's mom's basement. Welcome to another Rewind episode of The Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern, but when I practice introducing myself at all these holiday parties I've got coming up, I'm Fintern. Nice to meet you. I don't know about you, but I learned a lot from David on Monday, and while there were a ton of great tips, I might rethink washing and reusing my plasticware and just upgrade my set from time to time. Now that we've got party planning out of the way, let's chat about parties in general. Who else finds these awkward? Standing around with a bunch of people you barely know making small talk? Ugh. Well, I've got you covered with today's Rewind episode. Nick Shelton is an expert on networking and is a master at avoiding awkward conversations. I dug up this interview with him to help you and I both strut confidently into those parties and actually maybe enjoy them. This episode is from 2021, so enjoy the more recent show, but still ignore any mention of current events. Enjoy the show. Finn's turn out. <laughs> Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and have you put up your holiday lights yet? For those of you who celebrate, it's National Christmas Lights Day. For those who don't need to be in the spotlight but still want to shine in the workplace, we've got something even better. From The Connected Introvert, we welcome Nick Shelton. I think I might be an introvert, you know? I mean, by the time the cashier told me I needed to stop talking and take my groceries home, I was about ready to anyway. So, anywho, during our headline segment, we're talking about lowering fees on your investments. And later, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener. And of course, also, share my twinkling trivia. And now, two guys who no one is accused of being introverts, it's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G! That's funny because I actually play an extrovert on the radio, but totally introvert here. You like people, though. You're a people person. Yeah, but I I need my Joe time. Hey, everybody, welcome to podcast time. In the basement. When, when I'm Joe you do your, is your Joe time the same time as the alone time? Be my alone time with a controller in my hand. Oh, you're talking about Xbox alone time. Oh, okay. Yes, I see. I do. We got back from we got back from the holiday, and I totally needed just a little Joe in the Xbox time. It was good. Hey everybody, welcome to Introverts for the Win podcast. I'm Joe Salci, I average Joe money on Twitter. Once again, I had to put on the for the win at the end of that, and I have no idea why. I don't but know why just, either. It has become a thing. That other voice you're hearing is uh, Mr. OG. How are you, man? Just another beautiful day in paradise. Yes. We didn't talk about this on Monday's show because, uh, well, we kind of had to pre-record that. But how was your holiday? Kind of still going on. Mom's still in town. Uh, Kids went back to school, finally. It's never ending. The bad news is... is, Still have turkey? We're still having turkey leftovers? I like that part. That part could stay around forever. Yeah, I don't know. Like, after, like, five days of, what's for dinner? Uh, uh, Probably some turkey turkey in the fridge. Green bean casserole. Hey. Have turkey and leftover vegetables. The bad news is, is now that we're rolling into the holidays, we know what happens next. Now that uh, some companies are having get-togethers again, oh, gee, it's... A segment that we have had many years. We skipped last year because who was getting together last year? But you may be getting back together with the boss and with the team, or you might be getting together with people that you really want to impress. How does an introvert survive the holidays? And even if you're an extrovert, how do you make the most of it? Nick Sheldon here to help us uh, figure that out today. Company party. Big fan. Yeah. you're of company parties, that is. Oh, oh, no, thank you. So, so much happier now that uh, we don't have to do that stuff anymore. I remember the old American Express days of doing those. It's like pass, hard pass. But I you remember be... like one or two of them. No, oh, awful. That's because they were so boring. Just yeah. boring and just I remember trying to... The, vo- do, do you remember the big boss like wore like a blue tuxedo? Yes, I do. I do remember that. Like, Luckily, what? no tuxedos here in the basement. We got Nick Sheldon here. All right, big Wednesday show to kick off your December, so let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. 
And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Our headline today comes to us from Investment News. This is written by Emil Halaz. Emil's headline has a lot to do with professional companies doing something that we see all the time in the individual space OG, and that is trying to control fees. And of course, you and I don't talk about fees a ton because we feel like the brain dead financial media talks about fees uh, nonstop, doesn't talk about behavior enough. But I think in the spirit of the holidays, we should get into this because I think that fees are an easy win for people and companies doing the same thing. Listen to this, CITs continue taking over in 401ks, but the change isn't always easy. Did you know that CITs are on track to surpass mutual funds in target date assets? CITs are going to take over for the mutual fund space. What are CITs? Well, that's a funny thing. I didn't really know what CITs were either. I was sounds like, like oh, it sounds is- like something that's made up. This is totally new to me. According to Ceruli Associates, CIT's collective investment trusts are taking over the target date space. The products, which are sponsored by banks or trust companies, function similarly to their mutual fund corollaries, but don't have the same reporting requirements. And because of that, they're allowed to save a bunch of money, which... These companies all have already shown that they're passing on to you and I. And what's strange is that not only do you and I not know anything about CITs, it turns out that plan advisors don't know a lot about CIT. So when these these companies that run them go to the advisory committee and say, hey, we want to replace your target date fund with CIT driven target date fund uh, to save everybody some money. A lot of the time, they have to do a whole presentation on how on how CITs work. CITs, by the way, now at 43% of all target date assets last year, $1.18 trillion. A sneaky asset class because I had no idea. Hmm. Is it really an asset class, though? Or is it just a different type of product? Totally just, a, you're right. Totally just a different type of product. Same asset class, different way of managing it, uh, which is lower fee. This is the same thing the ETFs really did to mutual funds initially in the space for the average person out there where, it, you know, between a mutual fund and an exchange traded fund, now that trading fees have changed and have largely gone to zero, I think there's, is, is there any reason to use a mutual fund versus an exchange traded fund if you have both choices? Well, I mean, certainly all of the new money and all of the new product creation and all that sort of stuff is going in the ETF space. And you're seeing a lot of investment companies move their mutual funds into ETFs. There's some tax savings there uh, that we've talked about before. And companies know about those tax savings and people want to participate in that. But I also think that, the you know, what you give is something that you get eventually, right? I mean, or get is what you give. And it's just... It'll all work itself out. If the industry moves in that direction, then there'll be inefficiencies in some other space. You know, everything is moving toward obviously lower costs, which is great. Index-based products, which is fantastic. Lower turnover and lower trading costs, which is fine for the consumer. But there has to be something on the other side of it. You see, like, for example, on Schwab for for their uh, institutional portfolios or their intelligent portfolios, I guess is what they call them, right? Where they have kind of a made for you tool. It's commission free. It's, you know, slow cost, all that sort of stuff. And there's 4% of your money's in cash, which we've talked about before is being really not that big of a deal. If you think about like, it's not like you're going to have that money do something better in a short-term bond fund. If you're not going to use cash, if you're going to use the same asset class type of thing, but uh, Schwab right now is getting sued in a class action suit for not paying good enough interest. And they're like, well, (laughs) You know, we got to look at this big building. It has a mortgage, you know, and all these people in it. We got to pay for them somehow. So when Fidelity shows up and says, hey, we're going to save you a whole bunch of money, I'm often a little suspect of that. You know what I mean? It's like maybe well, they yeah. do, but, no, but I, in, in what, I totally agree. What way am I getting it on the other side? You know what I mean? Yeah. They're not just saving you money, they're saving both of you money. I mean, you're right. There's somebody who's losing out on the proposition. And in this case, it seems to be the mutual fund industry losing out as they create a new product category that that is able to undercut. But this is also something I think that the average person should look at, OG. I mean, 
don't get me wrong. You and I have talked a lot about behavior is the reason why people don't retire on time, not fees. But listen, if you're in, a, in an expensive mutual fund and there is a much cheaper choice in the same category doing the same thing, and hear me clearly, cheaper does not mean better. But if there's two choices, hell, go with the one that's less expensive. Yeah. I mean, again, we don't think, uh, at least I don't, I'm not going to speak for you, but I, I don't think that the reason that you use an index-based product or an inexpensive product is because there's no such thing as outperformance. And we get that kind of screwed up because people say things like, well, you can't, you know, you can't outperform. So you might as well have an index. Eh, you can. And there's lots of examples of companies and people who do over long periods of time. In fact, a lot of those, you just, just, just look up, you know, pull up uh, a Kiplinger article of top performing mutual funds over X period of time, one of 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, whatever. They're not going to be the least expensive choices. They're going to be expensive. The problem is, is you have to pick that person in advance and stick with them for 20 years, despite their higher costs. And despite them not having that 20 year track record yet, like Ray Dalio was not Ray Dalio 20 years ago. You had to pick them without much of a, of a, yeah. of a track record at that I'd time. Pick, I'd pick a different, different person than he, he was, but <laughs> I see what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. The 20 year, the 20 year track record didn't exist 20 years ago for a mutual fund that's 20 years old. I understand what you're saying. And also you have to have stuck with it during long periods of underperformance, which is the same, t same thing as disciplined asset allocation, right? You know, if you believe in that, you it, this is always so funny to me. It's like, well, you believe that you should be diversified. Yes. So why do you have all your money in NASDAQ? Well, I'm diversified. <laughs> like, no, you're not. <laughs> but why do I want to own small companies? They haven't done anything. That's the point. That's the reason why you want to own them is because you, you know, they haven't done anything for a period of time. And so you have to stick with it for forever. You have to, you have to invest forever the same way. Then you get the benefits of of the diversification, the benefits of the low cost and all that sort of stuff kind of compound after long times. It doesn't happen in six month increments. I was looking at a piece on Investopedia recently that was talking about fees and, and there's a disturbing trend though, when it, when it comes to fees and this is an AARP survey that they are referencing. That Listen you participated in. I, I, I took it. Did you have you, you did you have your four year chip already? That's why, that's why I, I did three years back back down <laughs> back it down. I got I got a couple months until I have my four year. According to this uh, ARP survey, listen to this: seventy one percent of people didn't even know they had fees in their four hundred one k og. They had no idea, and yet, you know, we've had all of this legislation that says it has to be laid out clearly now. And I think it is fairly, you know, when I look for fees in Cheryl's 401k plan where she works, I was able to see them fairly clearly. But 71% of people have no idea they're paying any fee at all. Uh, and I think at the very least, you got to know what you're paying. You got to know, you got to know how you're being Well, charged. and good luck figuring it out because 401ks in particular are super easy to hide all that stuff in there because, because the company pays for some, you pay for some, the company pays for a lot. It gets hidden in product costs. There's transaction costs that are hidden in there. It's very difficult to put that all together. And, and, and the disclosure that exists isn't public. It's something that goes to the manager, you know, your HR department or something like that. And they're quite reticent to hand that stuff out too. It's, it's one of the areas that is still... You know, you're you just kind of seen it gone through all the different layers, right? Individual stocks are now free to trade and ETFs are very inexpensive. And mutual funds are converting to ETFs. And there's one little piece there, and that's the retirement plan category that companies are still hanging on to. They're they're trying to to make some improvements there, but there's there's a long ways to go yet. Some fees Investopedia point to are easily avoided. Uh, one is to get a little passive in your portfolio. You talked about that, about that's yeah. not necessarily better. However, it, it takes you away from this game of having to pick ahead of time who's going to be the winner. So passive is generally cheaper, not necessarily better, but cheaper and consistent with the market. Uh, they talk about going with a, with a no load fund is a way to avoid some fees. This is a sticky one for me because if I'm working with a commission based advisor, I may be with the wrong advisor, but if this advisor spent a bunch of time helping you do something that you wouldn't have done on your own, right? 
we bemoan the fact that a load fund, and what I mean by load fund, guys, is that you're, you're paying maybe a 5% fee up front to get into this fund. And that's where the, the broker takes their part. This is where they get a commission for having you do something. But, oh, gee, if they were going to help you do something that you weren't going to do on your own. Yeah. Shouldn't they still get paid? Should they still get paid? Well, it's, it's, it's the same argument as as going to a car dealership and having already picked out your car. It's well, the same here, argument as, yeah. as, you know, real estate transactions and, and that sort of thing. I mean, you can never linearly recreate value in a service business. It just doesn't, there, there is no, there is no uh, boxes to check off that say that you could have not done this without help, right? right. Cause you can't prove a negative. It's like when you pay your CPA and they say, Hey, it's going to be 500 bucks. And you're like, dude, all you did was put stuff in a form. Like it's just all the data. And he's like, yeah, I know, but you might not have done that right. Well, but I might've, <laughs> What do you what are you paying for? A little bit of peace of mind, I think, in there. So well, and this is an opportunity to look at your fees with your advisor and to think about that relationship. Because when I hear people fire their advisor, I generally think that that's a good thing. And the reason it's a good thing is because you have decided that you're no longer going to abdicate the throne and the responsibility for being in charge of your money. You're going to take control of being in charge of your money. However, I think that what you need is a relationship much more like, and I'll use an example of General Motors. You know, Mary Barra is the CEO of GM, doesn't stop going to the meetings, doesn't stop understanding how a car works, doesn't just throw it all to a bunch of highly trained engineers who run the different, you know, product categories and departments around her. She still goes to all the stuff. She still understands what she's doing and she's in control. And now she's surrounded herself with some pretty damn smart people. I think that's a much, much better thing than I'm paying a bunch of fees. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. I don't know where my plan is headed. That type of relationship doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know that I have much more to add there. Yeah. Bam. How about that? Wow. There's a couple more in here, but where are the little fees? Like if you don't trade for a year, there are some brokers still out there that will charge you an annual fee if you don't at least make one trade because they're going to make money on the trade. Watch out for those. Uh, bottom line is just don't be part of that 71% that doesn't know what they're paying. Understand what you're paying. And I think you're step one of many steps in taking control of your money. Well, OG, uh, we got uh, Doug coming down the stairs. But before we get to him, I'm super excited about our guest today. Nick Sheldon is a guy who is an introvert himself and after transitioning out of the military is a gentleman who decided, you know what, I got to figure out a way to be an introvert and get ahead. And he helps lots of people who are introverts figure out that you don't got to be that, you know, flashy person at the party to make an impact. There is definitely a way that introverts can do great things. And by the way, even if you're an extrovert, Sometimes being the flashy person at the party isn't what an introvert wants to see anyway. So if your boss is an introvert, it might be hard to connect with that person. So understanding what is that, uh, what's that phrase, OG? Seek first to understand and then be understood. Yes. <laughs> I think, I think that that may apply here. So uh, Nick Sheldon coming up here, but uh, Doug taking a break from the, setting up the Christmas lights here at the house to uh, maybe have a rant, a little trivia, Doug. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. You know, it's that time of year where us normal folks put up Christmas lights, you know, except for the hippies, because they've had them up all year long because, you know, it's kitschy. Well, yeah, sure it is. Anyway, let's talk about how many hemp necklaces you got to sell to keep those puppies on. The other day, I'm just sitting here reading the Washington Post, and, and I find an article that says there are so many lights, NASA can see them from space. All that extra light costs energy, right? As Joe has told me, after countless times I've left the bathroom fan running all night, energy costs money, apparently. In fact, collectively, we spend about $645 million on Christmas lights. Ouch. Here's some trivia. 
According to Forbes, what one change to your Christmas lights can reduce your electric use by up to 75%? I'll be back with the answer right after I go do some detangling. Stackers, I'm the best damn Mrs. Claus impersonator in Texarkana, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. How about a trivia answer that saves you money, huh? That way, you can hire someone to find that one light that doesn't work and have them fix it. I swear, there's every year, there's that one light, there's that one light that you just got to keep twisting it, and you, like, you replace it, and then you... Uh, 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 okay, 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 all right. I'll get you your trivia answer. Here we go. Whew. What one change to your Christmas lights can help you reduce your electric use by up to 75%? Turns out that, according to Forbes, switching to LED bulbs can alone save you up to 75%. Just think, that would help you afford a little more eggnog, seeing as though the average house with Christmas lights spends $12 on their December power bill now, time for me to go plug these bad boys in. See ya. And here he comes down the stairs to the basement. Have a seat, man. Nick Shelton's here. How are you? I am great. Thank you for having me. It's a lovely basement you have. Well, you know, you don't get to say that often, do you? <laughs> no, 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 but, you don't. What a lovely, absolutely non creepy basement you have, Joe. You know, for an introvert, that might uh, be a little uh, intimidating thing to say. I don't know. I just found out lately, by the way, before I dive into being an introvert, that you also are a veteran. Thank you for your service. Yes, thank you very much for that. Uh, yeah, Air Force, Air Force veteran. We have so many veterans in our midst that are stackers, Nick, that that transition, can you talk first? And and I just thought just before we went live to ask you about this, a lot of people have difficulty transitioning, going from Air Force or any service out. Did you find that transition time was hard for you? It was very difficult. I know that when I was in, I said, I don't know why people would have any problems, you know, transitioning out. And for me, I was thinking, well, surely not me. I won't have a problem. And yes, it was super difficult because I was used to that structure you're in these really close knit groups of people that you're working with and this really good structure. So you know exactly where you fit into the, the structure and exactly what your duties are and your job is. And then when you get out, you don't have that structure or that tight knit group around you anymore. And it is uh, some people uh, deal with it better than others. I did not deal with it very well at all. So obviously you found a way as an introvert, though, to kind of create your own map and your own structure. And now you travel the world helping other people get some of that structure. This is a time of year when we need some of that, because as you and I both know, people are starting to visit each other again. We might have a company party this year where last year yes. we probably didn't. We right. may be in these social situations, the neighborhood get together, our religious organization, whatever it might be. You're an introvert. Tell me yes. how that feels to you to even be in that situation. Well, for me, it seems, uh, you know, it's always this little, little jittery thing that happens, but I always tell people, you just have to show up. Well, once I show up, then, you know, things can happen. Even if I don't do anything else, if I only show up, then that's the biggest step. Cause most people will just say, well, that's a bunch of people I don't know. I, I just won't go. I'll sit this one out. I'll have an excuse. But uh, I find that if you can just show up, that's half the battle right there. I love that advice, especially now, because I know I started going to conferences again. And as a guy who a lot of people think is an extrovert and I'm totally an introvert. I remember at the first conference I went to as, you know, uh, you know, I want to say post COVID, but we're not there yet. But you know what right. I mean? Like after that long dry spell, I sat, I, I sat Nick in my hotel room for an hour for no reason before I could get myself to leave. So show up, I think is good advice, but you know how hard that is. Yes, it can be very hard. So one of the tips that I tell people is if you can get 
uh, pre-known before you go that helps. So if it's if it's a work environment, then you'll already know a few people there that you can say, oh, those are those are my people. But if it's some kind of other organization or event, then Usually there'll be some kind of social media attached to it. So I'll say kind of observe the thread of chat that might be happening. And there's going to be you know, maybe two or three uh, movers and shakers on there that are controlling the conversation. And what you'd want to do is get on there and maybe ask a question or, or make a comment to whatever they're saying. And then you'll tell them, hey, I will be at the, uh, the event coming up. I'm looking forward to meeting you. And now... You, and you'll say, like, I want to put a face with the name, that sort of thing. And then now when you walk in, you're not walking in totally cold. You're walking in with someone who's expecting to meet you there. And so, and that person, if they're kind of a mover and shaker on the chat, they're probably also pretty heavy in that room as well. So they will, you can walk up to them, they're expecting to meet you, and then they can introduce you to people that they think would be a good fit for you. So it's a really easy way to get pre-known if you don't know anybody. Boy, that's a great piece of advice. I think for me, as I'm listening to you talk and I'm imagining myself in that situation, sure, it helps me get known and every everybody else know that I'm going to be there, but it's much more for my comfort, right? Like as an right. introvert, I feel way more comfortable if I'm not walking into a room of total strangers. Yes, exactly. And if you do have to walk into a room of total strangers, what I tell people to do is you're looking for people, you're hunting other introverts. You're looking for people who look like you feel. So you're going to be looking around the edges, looking for people that are messing with their phones, you know, checking out what the Kardashians are doing or whatever. You say, that person needs help. So you go and rescue them. So you go and engage with that person that's trying to blend into the wall. And they are going to be very happy to see you. And uh, it's, it's just much easier than trying to go into the middle of the room and find the most boisterous person you just say okay that person is that they look like i feel they look like they are trying to to not really be here and blend in i'm going to go over there and and talk to them well that's fabulous because once again as i'm hearing you talk i'm thinking of every time i've i've tried to help somebody else that gets rid of the pounding in my chest i'm no longer worried about me i'm worried about making sure this person feels okay and that service mentality kind of yes. kind of really helps you know you say you say on your website that that you are the five people and people probably heard this before you're the five people that you surround yourself with are you going in looking for who are these five people like if i'm an introvert you talked about maybe going on the website ahead of time but if i'm going to the company party event am i kind of thinking about who those five people are that i want to see ahead of time uh, so there's two ways you can think about that. So I don't do that. I, I There are some times where I will say, who are the people that are going to be there? So if I know the names, then I'll kind of look on LinkedIn and kind of get a little background information. So if I do meet them, then I can already have some, some conversation topics prepared. But usually my goal and what I tell other people to do is just try to make one solid connection. It doesn't have to be uh, some one of your top five that you're going to surround yourself <laughs> with, but it could just be in this, you know, some people will say, I'm going to try to meet 10 new people while I'm in there. Don't put that pressure on yourself. Just say, I would like to meet one person that I would maybe consider a friend later, somebody that I would like to learn more about and maybe see again at another point. And you might meet more people, but you want to come away with one solid connection. And if you don't, that's fine. But if you do, you have a new friend You're because we're trying to go deep instead of wide. We're trying to make real connections with people, spend a little time, get to know them. And if you find someone that you actually connect with, that's, that's great. One person, that's all you, all you need to make it really worth it. And if not, that's okay too. All of your points so far sound like they revolve around a single phrase that I'll use, which is take some of the pressure off yourself. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I've got somebody in my site. I'm in this situation where for whatever reason, I'm going to talk to them, right? Yes. I walk up. There's inevitably, as you know, Nick, maybe the possibility of, and as an introvert, I think about this probably in my head more than I should, but there may be some awkwardness. What types yes. of things can I do to try to get rid of that initial awkwardness in that initial meeting of somebody? Are there phrases that work well? Or are there ways to think about this that work well to make it less awkward if it is a cold meeting? 
Well, I would say, yeah, remember that it's not about you. It's about them. So you don't think about yourself and how you are uh, coming across. Think about helping that other person. But uh, also you might be thinking, what am I going to say? Yes. And I like to do, instead of memorizing some phrases that you, you're you going to forget when you get in there, I try to do observational uh, conversations. So I might comment on the temperature, uh, something that somebody's wearing. Hey, nice eyeglass frames. Hey, uh, something about the food. Oh, wow. They they have the uh, the giant pretzels with the cheese. Uh, last year, <laughs> we had a cheese incident. I didn't think they were going to trust us again this year. <laughs> right. You know, or... Like, did you have you been in the men's room yet? They have art. There's actual art in the bathrooms here. This is a fancy place. We should stick our pinkies out when we're sipping our tea or whatever. You know, there's all kinds of you just look around the room and make a comment about something that's going on in the room or something that that person is wearing or doing. So that way you don't have to memorize anything. It's just observational. And does that then lead to, hi, I'm Nick. You are. Yes, you could say, I haven't met you yet. Uh, my name is Nick, and you are, and yeah. then that'll kick it off. But yeah, usually I'll say something about, I'll, as soon as I go in, usually I go to the food, go straight to the food, and then you can, that gives you something to do with your hands, because now you're holding food and drink or a pen or and your food. So, and then you can comment about the food while you're at the food, or if you walk away from the food, you can walk up to someone and say, have you tried these cookies? Yeah. These are, you know, I'm working on my dad bod. And so <laughs> I got extra cookies here. Right. We call it a protective coating for my rock hard abs, you know, <laughs> protective yes. coating. The thing, other thing that scares us introverts, as you well know, is I get into a conversation with somebody that is clearly the wrong conversation Yes, and I cannot extricate myself. I cannot get out of this thing and I really need to get out. Do you have any strategies to get me the hell out of this? Absolutely. That's a really good question. This happens to everybody. So I, I always say you want to uh, be talking in groups of three. You're always searching for a group of three. So when I said hunting introverts, you're going to find that one person, start talking with them. But as you're talking with them, as people are walking by, someone's going to not be walking with purpose. They're just going to be kind of moseying by and you say, let's rescue this guy or girl, whatever. And you grab that person and you bring them into your group. So now there's a group of three. And what the beautiful thing about the group of three is now the conversation flows really well. Everyone's participating. So if you start running out of things to say, somebody in that group of three can pipe up and carry it for a while. And then in the conversation flows, if you have a group of four, usually somebody's sitting out and just watching and not participating. If it's a group of three, usually everyone's talking. And then this way, if there's three, it's easy for you to exit. Because you can say, oh, I'm going to go get another cookie to, you know, work on the dad bot again, or I'm going to go check out the bathroom or go yeah. get a drink or whatever. And then those other two people, they're still there talking amongst themselves, and you can go start another group of three somewhere else. But if you it's just you and that one person, it's hard to say, well, I'm just going to leave you by yourself and I'm going to walk off. But if there's three people, then you can leave them because there's still the two. And the other person can say, I can't believe he's leaving me with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's way easier if you have that group of three. It is way. But if it is the two of you, I don't know. I would think don't be afraid of just ending the conversation, just saying, hey, I'm going to go grab something to eat. Yes, yes. You can also do that as well. And it's yeah. Yeah, not hard to do. It's Harder when it's just two than it is with three, but yeah, you can just say, yeah, I, I'll see you in a bit. I'm going to go over here. Yeah. I want to ask about follow-up. I finally met the person of my year. Let's say somebody that can, ch I'm at the, I'm at the company party. I meet that person that can affect my career. I had a fantastic discussion with them. I clearly want to follow up. Yes. Is there a way for an introvert to follow up? And then are there dangerous things I shouldn't do when it comes to, following up. Ooh, I like that. Shouldn't do. Yeah. Well, well, let's cover the to do. Here's what, what I recommend and what I do myself is I like to, if I have their, their information, if I have their phone information, then I will actually record a video on my phone. So that way they can see me, they can get all the, uh, the body language in there and they can hear me. So it's not just an email and I'll say, Hey, it was great meeting you. I just want to touch base. And uh, maybe we can meet for lunch or, or get on a call and discuss this further. Another thing with that follow-up is 
I say, anyone that you meet, uh, what I do is every, quarterly, every three months, I go through all my contacts on my phone and my email, and I make a list of who I should have talked to in the last three months that I didn't. Oh, that's then, big. That is, yeah, that is big. I, I make a video and I send it to them. So it's really easy. It takes a few seconds to just send a quick video. And then that way you're caught up that you're top of mind with them. You say, this is what I'm up to. The, these are my projects I'm working on. How are you? How's the knee after the surgery? How's the new baby? Uh, how are things with you? And then they'll catch you up on there. So now you know where they are, what projects they're working on. They know what you're doing. So that way, if there's something that they can help you with, they'll say, oh, he's working on this. I, I happen to be you know, he's looking for speaking gigs and we're looking for a speaker to do this thing. Or like if they have a son that's about to go to college and you are an admissions counselor at a college or something, then you could say, oh, their their son is getting ready to go to, to school. Maybe he wants to come here. You'll already know. So it's not like they're reaching out after six years yes. and not talking to you. Hey, my son needs to go to college. Can you help him? <laughs> say, you haven't talked to me in six years. So I wonder if you have an agenda. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So... It's really nice to just stay top of mind. So I'd say when you first meet that person and, and the event's over, yeah, it's really great to send a video. If not, you can do a voice message. I did one this morning, sent out a little voice message. And uh, that beats the text and beats the email. If you have to do text or email, then you can. But I, I suggest the video and then maybe audio message. I have to tell not just you, Nick, but everybody hanging out with us that I've received those video messages and those audio messages before. And I've, I don't like them. I've loved them every time. I love them. Cause you can see, and a lot of times it's somebody thanking me or, you know, saying something nice. Well, it's always something nice, but yeah. even if it's just a contact, I always feel so grateful that they took the time to do that. And this is the first time that I've thought about two things. Number one is it really probably takes about the same amount of time as it does to fire off the text or the email. Right. And then second is why the hell haven't I been doing that? Like, I like <laughs> it so much. Why haven't I done that? I should totally exactly. be implementing this. Cause it, it, to your point, it's so easy, but we never think about it. And it's right. so much more personal. It's so much more personal. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk bigger framework. Let's get out of, out of this holiday season. And thank you for all of that. But when introverts really think about their communication and the effectiveness of their communication, I know that's what you really focus with people on. Are there a few yes. key points you can give us for our introverts in the audience that are really going to help them dominate? Yeah, so a couple of things that I really like. Well, body language. So body language is huge. We hear about it all the time. And it, it makes a big, big difference in how you are perceived and how you feel as well. And so I always thought, well, what's a simple simple body language thing that you can do. So there's I, by the way, I, I, by the way, not to cut you off, Nick, but I saw a number that I think that 92% of, right. of all communications, like nonverbal cues. So body right. language will be a huge part of that. Like we worry about what we say, but we don't realize about how we come across. Right. And so it's a massive thing. And it's, uh, once again, how people are looking at you and then how you feel, because when you change your body language, it also changes how you feel as well and how you mm -hmm. conduct yourself. And so two easy things that people can do is when you walk into an event or if you're just walking down the hall in your apartment building or something, I say, uh, you know, do the cape walk. You walk like you're wearing a cape and that you want that cape to drape properly and have a good flow. And that way, you know, your shoulders are going to be back. You're going to have a nice stride. You can't walk all weird and crazy with a cape. You, you walk really nicely, men and women. If you just imagine, and I just say to myself, cape walk, you know, and so it's because a lot of times if I'm walking down the hallway, let's say there's one other person walking down the hallway toward me, I always get clumsy all of a sudden. So I have to say cape walk and then do my cape walk. And also when you walk into a place, I've seen other people do it too. And you say, who's that? Because it, it makes a huge difference when you see someone walk in like that versus just kind of slink in the place. Yeah. Confidence but. boy. And it's funny people not watching us on YouTube. If you're not watching it on YouTube, I got to tell you this, Nick did it, but even as he's explaining it, I, I started doing it. Like I, <laughs> I totally started thinking about the fact that I'm slumping. <laughs> yes. And then, and that makes a huge difference in how, you know, people perceive you when you walk in anywhere, or if you're walking down the hall or walking down the street. Uh, the other thing is when, if you're sitting down somewhere, I call it 
Duke cookie face. This is my move. And this is how it came about. I, I was at a, a function one time and, and I didn't know anyone there. I was there with a, a woman I was dating at the time. And I said, all these people know her. They're going to be seeing who did she bring? And they're going to be judging me. Right. And they're going to be looking. And I don't, I, I don't know who's watching me when, what they're thinking. So how do I give the best impression? So it's, uh, I said, okay, for sitting, imagine a nobleman, right? A noble person. So I was like, okay, a duke or a duchess. And I said, how would a duke sit? And then so it's not stiff, but it's, you know, it's good posture, but it's relaxed because, you you know, you don't have the responsibilities of a king, you know, but you're a noble. So you're just kind of sitting there, good posture, relaxed. And then for the facial thing, I said, okay, uh, if I was walking into my best friend's house and I'm I open the door and I'm hit with the aroma of fresh baked cookies and I love cookies. I know I'm going to be offered cookies soon. And so I'm not going to be grinning like a crazy person, but I will have a nice smile like cookies are coming. Cookies are imminent. And so it's Duke cookie face or Duchess cookie face. <laughs> and so if you do this, I sit like a Duke would sit. And however you imagine a Duke sitting or a Duchess sitting, you sit like that. And then the cookies, or if you don't like cookies, you know, if, if you have diabetes or something, sugar-free cookies or something, uh, pie, apple pie, or something that you like. Insert and the thing, yeah. You insert the thing, and then you have that expression, and then it gives you this glow, and people usually approach you and say, I just wanted to come over and meet you, because you're giving off this aura, and it, and you feel really cool, too, when you're sitting like that, looking around. And uh, you're much more approachable. You feel great. People perceive you as really cool. And I remember after that event, uh, the woman I was dating's uh, co-workers, she said, they all loved you. And I only met maybe three people, but everyone was kind of watching and observing me. And she said, yeah, everyone thought that you were great. I don't know what you were doing. And I said, cookies are coming. And she had no idea what I was talking about. But uh, <laughs> but it works. She's and like, what so, the hell? <laughs> <laughs> so I just think that cookies are coming. And you, if you sit like that, it changes the way you feel. It, it It's immediate. I've used this a lot. It's my number one tip. If your listeners use it, they will see results the same day they use it. I promise. I got my Duke or Dutchie cookie face on. I'm wearing the cape. I'm a badass, Nick. <laughs> Exactly. Total badass. <laughs> Luckily for all of us, you've also written a book on this topic. It's an introvert's guide to world domination available, I think on Amazon, or can we get it also through your website? Yes. You can get on my website You can get it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. That's awesome. And we're going to link by the way, to all of those on our website. And of course at stackingbenjamins.com in the show notes and in our guide, the 201, if you want to sign up for that, it's stackingbenjamins.com slash 201 to get that as well. And the website is connectedintrovert.com, correct? Yes. Yes. That's correct. Awesome. Great. Want to make sure I nail that. Well, Nick, thank you so much from not just from me, but from so many of us that are introverts out there. You just help us survive the holiday season, my friend. I really appreciate Excellent. you and your time. Yes. Anytime. It's thanks for having me in the basement. I'm Andy Dwyer, and when I'm not pulling suckers off my tomato plants in my garden, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Nick for hanging out with us today. I love this idea about treating the company party as if it's another meeting about going in prepared, OG, about actually doing some preparation on this thing. And maybe then you won't do what, what have we all seen at company, at least I have. I have seen some people who are doing very well in their career mess it all up by becoming sloppy drunk and being really stupid. Hold on a second. The... Become sloppy <laughs> drunk. Oh, not become. Sorry. Backspace. Not, backspace. not become. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. But we've seen people mess things up. Go in with a plan. Yeah. Well, and, and um, especially if you have one or two connections that you're trying to, trying to create, and I've seen this happen very recently in a, a separate thing that I do, just in a different field altogether. But uh, a friend of mine knew a friend of mine knew a friend of mine kind of like a couple layers away. And then this unrelated party that I met through a different thing altogether was somehow connected to all of these people, but didn't know it. And I was like, oh, well, you must know Bill yeah. and Susan. And it's like, no, I don't know that. Well, you need to know Bill and Sue. And now I'm starting to think about like, how do I get these people connected? Because this guy's got a need 
that I know how to fill with this group over here. And I just have to make sure they connect and then that'll be boom, problem solved. Like, like thinking a bit like a, like a problem solver or who can you connect to? Uh, I like the idea of having your kind of list of questions ahead of time, you know, not, not formulaic, like, and tell me again where you were born, you know, not like that, right, but just, right, right. you know, I love this idea too of being a connector. And I was having a discussion recently with somebody about a brand that is kind of going off the rails that she and I know. And um, they think consistently, constantly and consistently about return on investment of every decision that they make. And she and I were talking about the power of being a connector where there is no conceivable quick ROI for you, OG. But the power of being that connector means people always come back to you. Right. And it's, it can be a huge monster ROI. And this brand is actually making some, you know, they say uh, there's short-term and obvious and long-term not so obvious. They're making these short-term obvious decisions that are going to be horrible in the long term because really making people frustrated with them because, hey, there's nothing in it for me, so I'm not going to do it. And man, does that get ugly in a hurry. Be, be the person that everybody needs to know. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. It's getting very close to Christmas cookie time. Oh. And when we were at Ameriprise, I don't know, I'm sure you guys had something similar, but we were in different offices. A lot of people don't know that, but we, we you were in an office in Troy. I was in an office in Farmington Hills. It was not terribly far away, but but we didn't share an office space. But one year, our office did like a Christmas cookie thing, like a book of all, like everybody said, well, here's my favorite, you know, and made a recipe book and I could never find it. Now, there were so many good, and when they brought them in and sampled them and I finally found the book. It was like in a box in the garage of like, you know how you have all that? Do you have all your stuff like from years and years <laughs> yes. and years, like binders of stuff where you're like... My planner from 1997, yes, I need to know what I did in April of 97. Oh, good. It's here. <laughs> I kind of wish I found my old, when we were moving, I found my old Franklin planner. Yeah. And I kind of wish I worked off a of Franklin planner still because oh. I felt so damned organized. Just, you know, the tactile feeling of going through your week and your mm -hmm. days and plotting out what you need to do is so powerful. All of your A tasks, all your v, B tasks. Listen, this is how much of a nerd I am. I was using a Franklin planner in high school, like when I was a sophomore, <laughs> like math test B2. <laughs> yeah. C10. Yeah. That's funny. Go to the park with my buddies. A1. <laughs> it's actually, you want to spend time with your loved ones. Uh, is, you can do when you're making cookies. Absolutely. And when you're using a Franklin planner, cause you're carving out your time for what's important. It's not spending a lot of time on your life insurance, which is why they've made buying quality term life insurance, Haven Life, actually simple. Head to stackybedjamins.com slash Haven Life now. You'll get a free quote. Oh, gee, if I had you as my beneficiary. Which you should. And this back pain I'm feeling right now keels me over. What'd you do with the half million dollars? Oof. I would uh, talk to you about increasing it. Because that's woefully <laughs> inadequate for me to be comfortable for, on. I didn't know you had that much of a life insurance need. Don't we start off with life insurance need? I you need a, you, you to have more, more life a, insurance. <laughs> you got more than a half million dollar need on me. That's probably the reason why I don't have more. Is <laughs> The answer's right there. I might find that you're bringing over uh, some cookies, some special cookies. Hey, Joe, eat your cookies. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to somebody calling themselves Steak Brother. Oh, boy. Say hi, Steak Brother. Hey, Joe and OG, this is Steak Brother, first time listener, long time caller. I've got a question for you about HSAs. My spouse and I have been contributing to our HSAs for a few years now, but have been paying all our medical expenses out of pocket with non HSA dollars, with the idea that we could use the tax advantages of the HSA as sort of an additional retirement account. We've been saving medical bills and receipts so we can let the HSA money grow and reimburse ourselves in the future. My question is, what record keeping is required for when we reimburse ourselves? Do we just need a receipt from a medical care provider? Do we need the associated bill as well? Do we need anything else? I recently reimbursed myself for a small medical bill just to see what the process was like and noticed my HSA provider didn't require any documentation from me. Seems weird. 
Does that mean the only requirement is to just keep accurate records in case we're audited in, in the future? It seems like something's missing. Thanks for your thoughts. By the way, my t-shirt size is a triple XL. I know you don't need to know that. I just wanted the other listener to know. Well, <laughs> I'm off to get me some day old coleslaw. See ya. Oh, man. I can Probably, 100% verify that that is not Steak Brother. As he saw, his question is 100% too intelligent. Like, way too, way too intelligent. What's going on here, OG? <laughs> For my brother? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, based on the Steak Brother story, absolutely. I don't think this guy would would do that yeah, uh, particular Definitely, definitely particular not thing. Steak Brother. What's going on here? Let's talk uh, HSAs. Yeah, it's just like 529s. You know, the company who's managing the money, uh, HSA provider or a 529 custodian, they don't care about the reimbursement rules. You call them up and say, hey, send me a check for eight grand. They go, okay, here you go. The only person that cares is the IRS. So yes, you are required to keep a receipt. And in case you get audited, the only person that would audit you would be the IRS. If you don't, you pay penalty. So it's pretty straightforward. And that's kind of the point. You know, we had that, who do we have on a couple of, gosh, it was like six, eight months ago we were talking about this, about how are you going to pull up a receipt from 2021 for a doctor's visit for 40 bucks in 2065? And the, the, the person, I can't remember who this was now, but um, somebody will find it. But their point was, just use the money as you need it. Like, don't worry about trying to, like, make your life complicated by hanging on to medical bills for 52 years, trying to optimize every little teeny tiny, you know, teeny tiny dollar. But this is one of the downsides of it. If you want to use, I mean, that and the fact that they could change the rules sometime over the next half century. Uh, but presently, um, HSAs are tax-free. And once you get to 65, um, you can use it for anything. So, you know, that's even better. But um, keep the receipts, man. And when you keep those receipts, man, the just the power of that compounding that he talks about, OG, can be absolutely huge. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing. That's the trade-off. The trade-off is you've got to hang on to this for, you know, if you're 25, you can put in 3500 bucks almost if you're an individual or $7,200 if you're a family. You know, that's uh, it's like another whole IRA contribution. You know, if you do that for 30 years or 40 years, you're going to have tons of money in this account. But you might not need it all for medical expenses. You know, there's uh, I'm kind of uh, torn on the use it or not conversation. You know, I mean, I get the math and I understand the benefits of compounding money tax-free, but um, I think there's a lot of moving parts that have to go right over the next, uh, you know, for me, 30 some odd years for it to 20 some odd years for it to, uh, you know, for it to pay off magically as opposed to using the benefit. Now I was in the hospital with the reaction from COVID and it was 13 grand. I'm going to put my $7,200 or whatever it is in my HSA, count it as a distribution and call it a day. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I want my life to be easy. I don't need to be ultra complex. I got a Roth IRA. That's tax free. I got a Roth 401k. That's tax free. So, Hit the easy button. Yeah. Well, which goes back to what we were talking about earlier, right? It's about behavior. Mm -hmm. If you can make it more complex and you can keep track of all that, then fantastic. Mm -hmm. But the problem comes when you fail to do things, not when you fail to find the, the, the one little loophole. I'd say use the money now, frankly, but that's, that's my two cents on the matter. That four and a half dollars gets you a peppermint mocha latte. <laughs> <laughs> so you can watch that sugar level spike. If you're, if which you're is also totally worth it. <laughs> The last time I had one of those, my stomach hurt so bad afterward. I don't drink a lot of milk anymore, just not in my regular diet. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this thing's made with all milk, and it's hot. It's hot milk. It's supposed to make your stomach feel nice and warm and squishy. And, and there's like sloshes around. It's like, because I didn't get the small one, of course. I got the uh, double extra venti, of course, you know, 72 yes. ounce. Uh, the gallon jug that you have to throw in the back <laughs> of the truck. <sighs> You run a straw through the window exactly. of your F-150? In the, in the back. 
Thanks for the question, uh, Steak Brother. And you know what? We're going to send you a code so you can get any size T-shirt you want. Congrats on the triple XL. What if he was uh, triple small? Hard to work on both of those. Yeah, I don't know what to say about that one. Lots of work either way. Get in the gym both head ways. To, <laughs> head to st- stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail, and you too can uh, chat HSAs with us. Hey, that's going to do it for today. we got a big show on Friday. Our old partner at Money with Friends, Bobby Rebell, joins us for what always is an interesting discussion. So she will be with us. Big thanks to everybody who wrote me about our special episode last Friday, the board game episode. Always fun to talk board games once a year on the show. So that was a good time. Of course, we talk board games, maybe a little more than that, but <laughs> yeah, just a good, good to have a full episode on that. All right, that's going to do it for today. Last but not least, if you're somebody looking to make better financial decisions next year, uh, head to stackingbenjamins.com slash OG because OG and his team are taking clients. That is the link to their schedule, and that's how you'll interface with them to find out how you can do better with your money next year than you maybe did this year. All right, that's going to do it. Doug, you got it from your man. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take some advice from Nick Shelton. You don't have to be loud and obnoxious to grow your network and improve your impact in your field. Thank goodness I don't have to worry about that. Second, Christmas lights are a wonderful way to throw away hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Maybe switch to something that'll save you a few bucks. Just like lower cost investments are an easy way to win as well. What are your investment fees? Start asking questions and you may pocket a few more dollars. But the big lesson? Don't waste money throwing out those old lights when you find a short in them. They attach a little extra light so you can fix it yourself. In fact, I've been sitting here since last Christmas trying to fix this one little short. And any minute now, I'm going to have it. I'm going to get it. Not wasting money here in this basement. Hey, could someone run out to Starbucks and grab me a peppermint latte while I work on this stupid freaking bulb? Thanks to Nick Shelton for joining us today. You can buy his book, An Introvert's Guide to World Domination, at your local bookstore, bookshop.org, or wherever you find your literature. We'll have links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2021, and is created by Joe Salcija. Our producer is Karen Rapine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from Joe and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Know how I know how brilliant Paulette is? She wrote the words I'm reading right now. While she's not putting awesome words in my mouth, she helps writers power their work and businesses power their words. See how she can help you at thatwriterpaulette.com. After you listen to our show, check out our show notes page and the 201 Deep Dives, written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 401 about all things money at the 201, our newsletter, at stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we get all of this goodness bottled up, it goes over to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart, who helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to talk about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and room mother in our Facebook group, The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. She and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all The Basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and until next time, remember, kids, it's not nearly as fun doing this naked as you might think.
it is rare that OG and I both see a movie. And uh, I can't believe we didn't talk about this when I saw it, which was the week it came out. OG just also saw it. This is uh, the latest James Bond movie, No Time to Die. We used to be able to get into a room with the enemy. And now they're just floating in the ether. When her secret finds its way out, it'll be the death of you. Oh my God. Target, not people. And the people become the weapon. Who is he? James, you don't know what this is? James Bond. Licensed to kill. In love with Madeline Swan. I could be speaking to my own reflection. Only your skills die with your body. And life is all about leaving something behind. Isn't it? Come on, Bond. Where the hell are you? Rami Malek plays the part, another great part, showing his uh, diverse acting skills of the bad guy. The bad dude in this movie uh, does a fantastic job as Daniel Craig. One last time, OG plays the part of Mr. Bond. And it's funny, the critics seem to like this. Colloquially, from the friend perspective, it's been split. Like, I see people that really didn't like this movie and other people that uh, that loved it. So let me ask you, where do you come down on the final Daniel Craig as James Bond flick? I thought it was a little slower than the other ones. I thought there was a lot less uh, stuff going on. It was very long. It was two hours and 40 minutes or something. I mean, it's a long... It's every bit any, as, as long as any other movie. But then you put it up against like Spectre or Skyfall, which were probably the best two of that kind of series, if you will, these last uh, five, maybe. I thought Casino Royale was fantastic. The first one that he did. Yeah, Casino Royale was good. Um, the the one in, the, in Bolivia was terrible. Skyfall was awesome. And yeah. Spectre was probably as good as Skyfall. So I think Skyfall is probably the best one. I'll go with Skyfall and Casino Royale myself. But anyway, yeah. 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 yeah so this, it felt there were periods, of, like a lot of dialogue. It took a little bit to kind of figure out what was going on. I mean, you got a, you got a sense of what was happening, you know, what the, what the bad guy was into and, uh, but, but why it happened the way it did took a, a bit to unpack. And I thought the ending was good. You know, it was kind of an appropriate ending, I thought. I saw people that didn't like the ending, and I thought, how do you not like that ending? Like, I thought that was, I'm with you. I thought that was the way it needed to end. Yeah. Yeah, I thought so, too. So, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's a James Bond movie with Daniel Craig. It's it's awesome. It's a great flick. It, it will not go down as one of the best Bond movies of all time, I think. Uh, but a good fitting end, a little fun story about <laughs> you know, disease that every, everybody's getting and stuff. It's like, I figured it out. They made a movie about COVID. (laughs) (laughs) But a little predetermined COVID in this case. Yeah. 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 But, uh, good enough by me. I'll take it. I liked it. I found myself with it the whole time. There were very few times when I was out of the movie. In fact, I didn't even think of it as long until we were leaving the theater. And I went, holy crap, I was in there forever. Yeah. But I didn't feel like I was in there forever. I was consistently in the movie. I really enjoyed it. I I actually enjoyed the fact that it was a little slower and that there was a little more going on. It felt a little heavier, of course, based on the way that uh, this took turns and the fact that it was going to be Daniel Craig's last one. Um, And you get the feeling that they're trying to reboot Bond, right? That they're going to try to make some changes. Well, you also read that in the press that they're going to make some, uh, with Daniel Craig going away, it's an opportunity for them to maybe go younger again. Uh, so with all of that stuff, I thought it was, I thought it was super good. I especially enjoyed the scene where they went to, uh, they went to Cuba. Yeah. I thought the Cuba sequence was really good. Mm -hmm. I was, I was right in the middle of that from the beginning to the end. Yeah, solid, solid eight and a half. I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I'm not with you on uh, Spectre. Uh, as my, I thought the Spectre was good, but not great. I really, really, it seems like uh, I like Casino Royale way more than you did. It just sounds like. 
Yeah. 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 I mean, Casino Royale is fine. That, that was the first one, right? His first that one? Was, that, that was his first one that really, I think, took the world by storm about how different he was going to be than uh, the last few Bonds. That mm-hmm. He was going to make his own mark. So good stuff. Uh, also, the, the role Ralph Fiennes plays in these, it, it, it never ceases to amaze me. As great an actor as I think Ralph Fiennes is, how every time you see him, he's a different dude. I mean, he's, don't get me wrong, he's always Ralph Fiennes, but that guy can play anything. As can, once again, Rami Malek, again, is the bad guy mm-hmm. here, can play anything. These people as actors are fantastic. What did you think about, at one point, by the way, and this is a little bit of a spoiler, but not much, uh, they reassigned the role of 007 at one point. What did you think about that whole back and forth? It didn't bother me. You know, there's some people who will bother, I suspect. I thought it was funny when he gets reappointed and uh, he's like, you're back to 00 status or whatever. And 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 the other 007's like, and what's the number? <laughs> and 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 like it just gets said and then there's like they keep on talking and then and then it gets said again like so what's the number and like it you know so that the new 007 is like what hold on what's the what number what number i loved i thought that? that was very well written i yeah. thought it was just very well a great back and forth about you know about how in the big scheme of things the number means nothing right means yeah. absolutely zero and it was a it was a good point yet there's going to be this little point of contention through the movie, which I thought may also made it, made it fun. I thought so. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Go see uh, no time to die. Rentable on is, Apple TV, which is how we did it. Is it now? Gotcha. Yeah. yeah you can't buy yeah. it, but you can rent it right now. Yeah. Uh, Cheryl had knee surgery. So sadly we are now digging into w- what's on the television. No going to theaters, which I've loved going back to the theater. So I'm kind of sad that uh, those days are over for at least the next month for me, especially at this time of year when there's so many good movies coming out. I wanted to see Ghostbusters, and uh, we instead saw a different movie that maybe I'll talk about next week. 